before I jump into that, a few quick announcements um, about the quiz results. So those are graded. Um, so just some notes on on the quiz. So one of them is just that we should be thinking of processes uh, versus solutions. And so this has been, been one of the big themes in the class. We've talked about this um, at least a couple of times. Um, somehow in these kinds of questions, I'm not really so concerned with people getting like the exact right answer for everything. Although that's of course important in mathematics. Um, one of the things I stress for this class is that we want to um, essentially come out, come out of this class with a, a good sense of what it means to communicate mathematics to somebody else and to like write it down in a way that somebody else um, can read and comprehend it, um, which seems minor, but I think it's sort of one of the, the better skills to pull away from this class because I know you'll run into it sort of whatever major you're doing if you use mathematics in any way you may or may not use this exact mathematics that we're studying um, right now. Um, and so, you know, maybe at some point you'll have to get help from somebody or you'll have to look something up. Um, and I think in modern times, like, you know, that the places you get help might be like the internet. There are places like Math Stack Exchange and Math Overflow, which we saw in a previous class. Or, you know, you might be asking if, if you're doing research or something, you might ask your principal investigator to um, help you with a mathematical derivation or something. And so what you'll actually be tasked with doing is sort of communicating what you've already done, sort of what you've tried, what process you've gone through. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's, that puts you in the best position to get help because then you're kind of getting the most efficient help possible. Um, you know, people can kind of laser in on uh, and focus on exactly which part um, might need to be uh, changed or improved or whatever. So it's great for this class, of course, because it makes it easier to, to catch exactly where, you know, it makes it easier for me to catch exactly where mistakes are. But I think it's also like the, the important life skill if you're just communicating in any mathematics, there's a nice way to do it clearly. Um, and then of course there's like the method too, like you wanna be able to explain the method to other people, uh, not necessarily just write down the right solution. Um, I think there are a few people, so like again, most of this class I think is review for a lot of people. Um, if you've taken some kind of, I mean, definitely if you've taken like a calculus class in high school um, or if you've taken a pre-calculus, um, but at least in this unit, a lot of this should have, should have come from a trigonometry class if you haven't seen that, that's that's totally fine. Um, but that's kind of how um, a lot of this is pitched is that, you know, maybe you've seen these trig functions or something before in a previous class. And we're kind of, you know, reviewing it because you need a lot of these things for calculus. I'll show one example. Um, but also kind of looking at a nicer way to sort of remember it. Learning a, a few new things, hopefully. Um, you know, these things like polar coordinates um, which give you a different way to look at things and again would make calculus a lot easier when you go on to take that. Um, so yeah, processes over solutions. Um, I want to say something just about using exact ratios whenever possible. What I mean by this is a lot of people on the quizzes so that entire quiz you could have done without a calculator and actually like 90% of this class you can do without one. Um, and it's actually sort of preferable to actually just keep the, like if you're doing uh, a problem where you have, you're finding sine of theta or something and you have the actual side lengths and they're given to you as like integers. So maybe it's, you know, something like this kind of triangle here. And trying to find sine of theta and you're given um, I don't know maybe that's six maybe that's seven it has to be longer then I would just go ahead and make that six over seven and leave that as it as is um, without evaluating that or anything 
Um, I think it's much nicer to have the actual exact value um, because then somebody can plug it into, you know, if this was somehow like you were doing trigonometry for NASA or something and you were sending a space shuttle off um, and you told them this was equal to, let's see what actually, what is that? Maybe six sevenths, we approximate that in a floating point number on our computer. Get something that's like 0 0.85. So if I just told somebody that sine of theta was equal to 0 0.86, um, this could be a problem, right? This sort of depends on the accuracy needed. You know, if you're on a space shuttle and you're trying to like fix your trajectory or whatever, this could be the difference between, I mean, I don't know, hitting two destinations kind of, it depends on how far you go. Um, so you would want to either communicate that this is an approximation um, or just leave it in the exact form. And then, you know, whenever you turn your solution over to NASA for their space shuttle flight uh, path, then they can plug it into their supercomputer and, you know, approximate it exactly as well as they'd like. Um, but so that's that's kind of why, why it's sort of a preferable thing to do for trig functions. Quick note on polar coordinate stuff. Um, just so remembering that you have this kind of situation in a theta, this was your y hat, this was your x hat, this was an r. When you go to look at this, this point, you get some like x and y value out of it. It's really important to remember that this is actually r cosine of theta and r, oops, sorry, uh, r sine of theta. And it's only actually equal to, so like for example, right? So what, what is this quantity? This is X, this is Y, and let's say you're given that. Um, some people will put, you know, like tangent of theta or what are they, let's see. All right, so some people were like um, going to look at this X coordinate and they said, all right, X is equal to cosine of theta or something like that. And this only is true if um, if r is equal to one. All right, so that's only if you're on the unit circle does cosine of theta exactly correspond to the x coordinate, and does sine theta exactly correspond to the y coordinate. Otherwise, you have to take into account this radius that's scaling you off the unit circle. And I wanted to point out. Um, I guess this might be coming up on a pre-class, but why, um, why do any of this? <laughs> so the answer, of course, we're in our pre-calculus class, and uh, you know, a lot of this is geared towards uh, things you may need for calculus, and so. What happens there is you're trying to solve something called an integral, which you may or may not see in a first calculus class. I think you probably do it the, the class of UGA, for example. Um, and what happens is that some of these integrals, like going back to, so these are just some kind of mathematical equations. They're really difficult to solve in general. Um, if you just write down a random equation like this, you will probably not be able to solve it. So there, there's, there's this big bag of techniques for solving these, these things. Um, and one of them is doing a trigonometric substitution, which is essentially letting one of your variables where it's like an X or something, imagining that X is the cosine of an angle or the sine of an angle. This lets you bring in all of the tools we're looking at now with trigonometry to solve this, this kind of problem. And at the end of the day, so if you're solving some integral I'll just leave integral in quotes because it's just something we don't know about yet, but maybe by the end of today's class, we'll say something about it since it's sort of related to what we're doing in the project. Um, you'll do some stuff and you'll end up at a, a solution that where you need to know like the cosine. So this is just an example. 
uh, maybe the cosine of the sine of uh, theta. Let's see here. I guess I should do it like this. It should be the cosine of the arc sine of 37 fifths is equal to something. And that something will be, you know, your sort of solution from the problem. And the question is, uh, what is this thing? You're evaluating one trig function at the functional inverse of another trig function. And I mean, I guess maybe you could plug this into your calculator, um, which might be useful. Um, all right, so this is this is kind of why we're talking about You'll see in pre classes and in the videos that we're talking about domains and ranges of sines, cosines, arc sines, arc cosines, things like that. Because um, if we, this is a periodic function, it's just overall of the real numbers. It doesn't actually have an inverse if you kind of allow all numbers in the domain. So we have to do something kind of familiar from maybe the first month of class or something where we restrict the domain. Um, and only allow angles within a certain range, certain uh, interval um, as angles in our domain. And that'll give us a function that's injective, provided we're always restricted to that domain. Um, so that's at least why we're covering some of that. And like arc sine doesn't make sense everywhere. We have to restrict the domain down. And then why we're doing the kind of geometry part is that um, what you usually want in most problems, like say if you're doing uh, physics or econ or bio or chemistry and you have an integral that you want to solve, um, you actually don't want the numerical approximation most of the time if you're trying to like establish the theory. Like somehow whatever this thing evaluates to as a number doesn't really tell you much about the underlying situation. Um, you can't like analyze the function um, and do any like prediction. So remember the function is kind of like your model and you kind of want to know what the actual model is in terms of an equation. And so you want um, something that doesn't involve plugging into a calculator for this. And so the way that you might do a problem of this form, so you would have some triangle, you have some angle theta that you're thinking of. And theta is really this, right? So arc signs, any arc function takes in a number and gives you back a theta. So it's it's asking for what theta is the sine 37 fifths. So you would just go in and label a triangle. Um, you would see that, let's see, so sine is 37 fifths. So there's kind of two ways to do this. I'll do them in different colors. One of them is, um, so let's see if theta equals arc sine of 37 fifths. And I can apply sine to both sides. Sine of theta equals sine of arc sine 37 fifths. This will imply sine of theta. Well, it equals something. But the moral of the story here is that trig functions are complicated. Like they, they aren't as nice. Uh, to work with as some of the other functions we've looked at, like exponential and log were, were a nice inverse. Um, but so, I mean, what, I, what I'm saying here is that, like, I wish we could just uh, cancel these two, right? And just say that this is equal to 37 fifths. And that would be great because then we could continue with the problem. But this is, um, I guess, on a restricted domain. So the problem is, is that there are infinitely many angles that satisfy this. That sine of theta is 37 fifths. I mean, if nothing else, if I find one angle, I could just take that angle and then push it by two pi and get a, to a different number for the angle. It's, it's bigger. I just added two pi to it. Um, but now this is a problem because it's not a function, right? I have two numbers mapping to one or one number mapping to two numbers. So you're going to either have a problem with injectivity or you're going to have a problem with just being a function. 
So that's kind of why we're looking at this restricted domain stuff too, is because you'd like you'd like to make a step like this where you sort of just cancel sign and arc sign. But provided you can do that, um, then you can write. We know that this is like opposite over hypotenuse or whatever. So you just do. And I guess this isn't realistic. I mean, five thirty sevenths. It's the better one. So the one I had was kind of. It was something outside of the domain of arc signs. You have to do some trickiness to figure out what it is, but just for simplicity, just flip those. Um, flip it here too. So this was five over 37, so it's a small number. That's just saying that that's five, that's 37. Would have been a problem otherwise because the hypotenuse has to be longer than either of the legs. Um, in which case, if you had this situation, you could find out what this is. And I guess in this case, it's five squared plus a squared equals 37 squared. So this thing is square root of uh, whatever it is, 37 squared minus five squared. And oh, great. Now, what, we, what were we trying to do? We had this thing, so it's the same cosine of Theta is equal to question mark. Okay, but now we, we don't have to evaluate anything. We just have cosine of theta. So there's the adjacent and the opposite. Opposite. Sorry, the adjacent and the hypotenuse. And whatever this is, this is root 37 squared minus 5 squared all over 37. So we get just a nice exact answer out of that. Um, and things are good. So saying there's another way to approach this. Um, one thing you can do is scale this all down to the unit circle. So you could just say that the opposite side was 5 37ths here in blue. You could say that this hypotenuse was just length 1, because this is still the same ratio, right? If I just take the opposite over the hypotenuse, I just get 5 over 37. And this becomes something different uh, with the relation uh, you get at the end of the day ends up being this thing. OK. So that's all I wanted to say about that is that there is some reason for doing this. This comes up in a certain type of calculus problem you do. Um, and it's good to learn sort of both methods. You want to have some like you need this like geometric way of doing it when you run into the calculus problem. Um, and and uh, having this this polar thing in your back pocket makes some of these problems e easier too. Okay, and then just the last note, just on project stuff is uh, there's a video under e uh, ELC content projects, and everybody should definitely go and watch that. And uh, I'm going to somehow incorporate this into the rough draft uh, grade just because this is like a full explanation of most of what you have to do for this project that the person who wrote the project actually made. So this is like your number one best source for anything to do with the project. Definitely make sure you've watched the video before you turn in any kind of draft or write anything up. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if this is something that like students are super aware of, but like in ELC, it tells you as the instructor, like if people have like gone and looked at a resource that you've put up, which is uh, for the most part kind of creepy. I don't actually use it for much, um, but in this case, I'll probably just go in and check that one thing just to make sure that people are sort of, right? If you're turning in a rough draft and haven't watched the video that tells you what you have to do for the project, that kind of puts you on a on a problematic route for the, the project. So just wanna make sure we catch that early. OK, so let's talk about what's actually going on in the project. So project details. And sorry, I actually just heard my coffee finish brewing. So let's take a quick like one minute breather. Feel, feel free to like stretch your legs or something. Uh, be right back.
Okay, hopefully everybody uh, is back now. Um, okay, so let's see. So uh, just a quick note. One thing is, maybe I'll just put this as a, a big warning sign. Uh, refer to class notes. Uh, the explanation video and the handout. Um, refer to those closely as you're writing. Um, I think this, this honestly isn't a problem for most most projects, but um, if you're losing points on the project, these are the easiest points to lose. Just if you're missing something that um, you know, we covered in a class lecture or something that's like explicitly listed out in the rubric that you're attaching to your project um, or something that's explicitly listed out in the, um, the handout that has to be included in the project. Um, just make sure you're consistently referring back to that and just double check everything before you submit anything. Um, makes my life easier because I could just go through and check all the boxes. Yes, this is there. Yes, this, yes, that is there. Um, but yeah, so, so definitely refer to all of the resources you have as you're writing things and just make sure um, you have as much as is required. Um, and then also just be referring to that consistently so that if you have questions, um, you can bring them to office hours. I'll maybe say, if I don't say, um, so maybe I'll just put a reminder here. I'll have some office hours today. If I, if I don't say what they are at the end of class, please do remind me. Um, so we're, we had this, this kind of model we were talking about. Hopefully everybody's familiar with the situation now of you know, this leaf sitting and having sunlight uh, hitting it at some angle. And this was a complicated three-dimensional situation that we turned into a two-dimensional one. And what I've done here is just pick a spot where the leaf will be. There was this normal vector emanating from the leaf, which is telling you the orientation of the leaf, kind of what, what plane it sits in. And we had this uh, light vector. Maybe I'll do it in orange. Coming in at some angle and right Remember, we did this funny thing where I just changed the direction of it. So that way, they're kind of two vectors sitting at the origin. This isn't too big of a deal because we're just thinking of a line segment, really, or some like direction with some magnitude. Um, so this vector only differs from the light vector. The light is coming into the leaf. It differs from it by a negative sign or something like that. Um, but we don't have to worry about it um, for anything we're doing because we're going to decide what the what scaling we're using anyways. So we'll force it to be in the right direction. So what happens here is that you have a theta sub L and a theta sub LN. Sorry, I forgot to say that this is a vector we're calling L, L for light and for normal. And okay, so hopefully this situation is familiar to everyone. There are sort of two angles to worry about here. And this L vector is traveling, I guess we should say that L depends on time. So it is a vector that depends on time. So if I plug in one time, maybe time zero, I get a horizontal vector. If I plug in time 12 noon, I should probably get like a vertical vector. And in somewhere in between uh, midnight and noon, I should be getting this orange vector, like the way it's drawn here. Okay, and here are some things that we want sort of need to be saying like a rough draft. Okay, so the first one is going to be a graph of, I guess theta L of T is the easiest one to start with. That's right, these angles are changing over time. So we should be able to come up with some kind of function that models that changing behavior. 
labeling the axes is going to be extremely important in this project. Um, so if you if you aren't like really clear and precise about your graph labeling, uh, you probably lose easy points. Um, and the reason it's so important here is because we have so many different functions with completely different domains and ranges that it, um, we really have to be precise about exactly what we're plotting and where. Um, so there's zero. Sorry, this is a time. So there's 12, there's 24. Um, and what we have is that we know that at time zero, it should be an angle of zero. So maybe we know that there's one point here. And also at time, uh, let's see, how does this angle work? So go back up to this model, it's theta sub L. So this is one that's traveling from zero to pi. And after it gets to pi, I guess it just stops or resets to zero. So we want to, well, I guess there will be two important points. One of them is pi halves, right? Just a vector pointing straight up. And one of them is pi. And I imagine that at pi halves, we want that to happen at noon. So maybe just, you know, pointing directly up halfway through the day. And then by the time we reach 24 hours, we want this to have reached an angle of pi. All right, and this is just the angle that the sun is making with the, the plane of the ground. Okay, and then you just need to find some kind of function that hits these lines. So you could do some kind of linear function and maybe what they do in the example. Uh, maybe you do something, maybe you think it's like doesn't change for a while very much, but then all of a sudden it kind of changes a lot and then kind of slopes out to something like this. So this is a situation where it's kind of like it's spending a lot of time near zero. So maybe for the first six hours of the day, the angle isn't changing that much or something, but then between six and 9 a.m. or something, all of a sudden it's sweeping out from like zero to that. So it's kind of making some more quick movement um, and it's like really quickly going here and then it kind of, once you get to sunset or something, it like clo um, slowly descends to that. This is like at what speed is this vector moving? That is what this theta L of T is. Um, yeah, you might think it's something totally different. You might think it's like it really quickly ramps up and then maybe it flattens out here or something like that during the day and doesn't change much and then really quickly sets sort of a lot of options for functions here um, and you have to pick. Okay and then similarly and I will post these notes up so uh, don't worry too much if you aren't able to write it down. Um, the other thing we'll need is theta ln of t so just going back up to the, the model, this is now the angle between n and l. And so I would just like you guys to come up with some function that models this behavior. This may not be explicitly mentioned in the project um, handout, but this is something I'd like to see in the analysis, just to make sure you have a good handle on what the problem um, is and sort of this whole vector situation that we've been talking about. Sorry, I should have label this coordinate here. This last coordinate was 24 pi, and this middle coordinate was 12 pi halves. In this situation, theta ln we know is going to be, actually it's going to be, so it's going to start at, yeah, so this is going to be a little bit Yeah, so let's do something like this where it's between zero and pi halves, for example. So zero would mean these two vectors are lining up directly. Pi halves would mean they're exactly orthogonal. And I guess what's starting at time zero is they're orthogonal. So there's a, a zero pi halves point. We know that at time 12, they are completely lined up. So there will be a point here at 12 
zero. And we know there will be time 24. So this will be 24 in the T coordinate and then pi halves again. Um, just coming from, again, this, this is all just coming from this model that we've set up. What's happening at time 24 is that the vector is rotated all the way to the left. So the green vector is pointing straight up. The orange vector is pointing straight to the left. The angle between them should be uh, you know, like a 90 degree angle. So they're orthogonal, so the angle is by halves. And you need to come up with some kind of function that um, interpolates these data points somehow. So some function that just hits these particular points. And you might say, okay, maybe it's um, maybe it's linear. But that's kind of what I've drawn here, like this piecewise function or piecewise linear function. Um, so you might want to try that. You might say, okay, maybe it's somehow related to theta um, L. So this here is like a theta LN axis. Up here was like a theta L axis. And this function that we're drawing here was theta L of t. And this function we're drawing here is theta ln of t. And you might expect that these functions are related somehow from the geometry, in which case you can do that. Maybe it's just this is some modification of the previous function. That would be totally fine. Um, or Okay, so you might you might expect expect it's something totally different too. Like you might expect it's um, maybe you think it's more like a parabola or something or part of a sine wave. Um, I guess there are a lot of things you could do here. Maybe you think it's something like this, where it's like mostly constant for most of the day, and then it kind of does something like that, and it kind of comes back up or something sort of a lot of options that, that could happen here, and these are up to you. Um, if you want some ideas for how to, for like things that you could use here, let me just pull up a quick, um, if I can find it. Okay. So here's here's a, um, so this is something you actually do like in real life all the time, or at least in my real life. So I've, I've talked a bit about how I used to do like computer science stuff uh, in industry before I started graduate school. Um, and so one thing you do is, so CSS is this language that you use for making websites. And you can do all these kinds of like animations in them. Um, so this is like, you know, if you're doing some work for a client and they want like a logo that's animated, you know, this is kind of the easiest way to do it. And so you have to use this kind of function, you know, this modeling function stuff all the time to determine. Um, so usually you want animations like a periodic or sinusoidal behavior. Um, and these are kind of like the basic building blocks of them. So let me, let me see if there's one that really illustrates kind of what we're doing. And maybe something like this. I don't know if you can see kind of how this like height is changing over time in this particular function. So the little thing on the right hand side is supposed to indicate, um, you know, like maybe how an animation is coming into the screen over time. You can see that it comes in, like if we have this kind of sloping in business here on the, this like first little leg of the function, if it's kind of flat at the beginning, it's saying, you know, move really slowly at first. And then if it's like a really steep um, incline, this is saying, you know, speed up. So you can see it kind of like pauses at the bottom and then it moves really quickly to the top. And then, you know, it kind of bounces back with this other function here. So this is like a piecewise sort of function. Um, so you can just kind of use this, something like this. These are called easings. So E-I-E-A-S-I-N-G-S. -E -E you can just search these on Google. This is easings.net. Um, you can see that there are sort of various, um, just to get an idea of like how these, these functions behave. Here's something that's more cubic in nature. You can see it starts off really slow, which is kind of like the rate of change is slow near the beginning. So the speed is slow because it's sort of flat in this little area down here. And then as you get towards the middle, the slope kind of gets, you know, the slope increases. And so it sort of speeds up once you're about halfway through. 
Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's worth, let me see, maybe one more here where it's kind of like really steep at the beginning to compare that. Something really steep is going to like come in really fast. And then once it's kind of like leveling out here, this is saying that once you're close to the des destination, kind of slow the speed down a little bit. And you can see it kind of goes up and down. So you don't have to use these in any way, shape or form, but just to help give you like an intuition of like how the how the, the like curvature of the graph. So the curvature is like somehow measuring a rate of change, um, like how it affects the speed of this theta angle changing. Um, you can get some ideas from that. Okay, um, let's talk about just some things that sort of need to be, oops. So need to, Uh, so just some things that definitely need to, to make it into the project, hopefully in the first first draft, um, but definitely in the, the final one. So for the above, uh, actually, sorry, let me do one more function and then we'll, I'll say um, what you need to do for all of them. So let's think of this as like a part one is determining these data, fun data functions. Part two is modeling this like energy over time. And actually, I wonder if I have, oh, let me just draw the graph and then hopefully it'll make sense. So what's happening is that we have some energy kind of hitting the leaf over time. And at time zero, at zero, you know, it kind of depends on the time of day. You know that there's sort of the most energy that could ever happen. And it happens when the vectors are lined up completely. And this is like, uh, I think it's like 168 milliwatts or something. I forget the exact number. This is time 12. This was time 24. So we know a few points on this. We know 0, 0. We know that it maxes out at 12. So 12, 168. And we know that by the end of the day, it's back down to 24, 0. And so this one, you want to. Um, this one's not linear. So you don't want to do the same thing we did before. It was kind of like this triangle um, hat shaped thing. Um, instead, what we want now is the energy density should be like more smoothly varying over time. Um, so we don't want any of these like sharp uh, changes in the graph. And if you've seen like calculus before, what's happening, like what's happening in a graph like this is that you have a tangent line at this point um, or you want to have a tangent line because the tangent line is the slope of it is measuring a rate of change and you want that rate of change to be uh, continuous. So you don't want it to like jump or anything, you know, all the, you know, you're going two miles an hour and then all of a sudden you're going 200 miles an hour. It's not like physically reasonable for that to happen in like an instant. Um, so you want to like have a well-defined tangent line there. And the problem with this kinks um, with these kind of uh, cusp sort of points is that we don't know what the tangent line is. If you're coming in from this way, it kind of looks like the tangent line is shaped like that. If you're coming in from the left, but then if you're coming in from the right, it kind of looks like the tangent line is shaped like that. So there's no well-defined tangent line there. And usually this is telling you that like it's somehow corresponding, like it's not really an accurate model, model of physical situations because in the real world, nothing kind of changes instantaneously like that. It, like gradually changes, even if it's quickly. Um, so what you want here is that maybe a function that looks more like this. So this one you'll have to sort of, oh, sorry, I haven't drawn that very symmetrically. Still not super symmetric, but okay. 
um, just some kind of like function smoothly, not having um, so no no points like uh, this one. So no spots where the function abruptly and suddenly and instantaneously just changes direction in the graph. Um, so there's a lot of ways you could do this. This one I won't say as much about because this is like coming up with this is kind of a, the, one of the key pieces of the project. I'll say that maybe you could use a, a sine wave here. Like you could take a sine function or a cosine function and kind of shift it up. Um, and maybe you'll end up with something that looks, uh, so what would that look like? You would get something like this. Like you would get one half period of the sine wave happening here. And of course this function exists everywhere else too. So you might have stuff outside of that. In which case you might need to make a piecewise definition to say maybe it's, well, I don't know. Yeah, you want to define it at least on zero to 24. So you might get something like this from like a sine or a cosine. Um, you might decide that something like a parabola is, uh, works here. You might find some totally different function, but this is uh, up to you to come up with. And then a question here is, is this a function of, let's say, theta sub L or theta sub Ln? What I mean here is that, so this is some graph of a function E of t. And maybe it's the case that E of t it's just equal to f of theta ln of t. So maybe I just obtain this graph by coming up with some function f and then plugging theta ln into it, maybe. So f would be a function of theta instead. So you can kind of analyze it that way. Maybe you think that the energy depends on the theta, in which case you could come up with some um, energy as a function of instead of t down here, you would have a theta. And that's totally fine. And then the theta you could plug in would be, well, theta ln of t, you can plug t's into the theta function. So then you could get a graph like this where it's e versus t. But this is a, this is sort of an arbitrary choice you're going to make. I'll say a little bit about what has to be included for these. So need to include the following. So you will definitely need to let me do it this this way for theta L of T theta ln of t and e of t formulas for all of these things, uh, graphs. Just remember that the labels are important. Uh, maybe say some words about what the domains and ranges are. Um, explain the periodicity. And so what I mean here is that maybe if your domain is say 0 to 24, right, so these are the um, times you could plug into a theta, for example. Um, and you know, your, your range is, maybe if you're in that first case of theta sub L, your range is like zero to pi. Um, you should explain, so you, you've defined a function on one domain, zero to 24. Um, but now think about how we would apply it to the real world. We would want this, this would just be repeating every day, right? So after 24, it's kind of like the function resets but you're at like hour 25 and it's the same thing as being at hour one. So just one hour after the starting point in both cases. 
So you want to explain how do you, you define this function on a restricted domain and range. You want to now define how would you extend that out periodically to make it work for all time. So how to extend domain to all real numbers. Whereas here you might have like the domain of theta sub L of T was maybe this interval zero to 24. So you've given me a function that I can only evaluate. I can only plug in numbers between zero and 24 in this step. And if I try to plug in 25, it's like the computer throws an error. The function doesn't know how to handle it. Um, but how can you, how can you take this function you've defined on one little chunk of the real line and make it work everywhere? So I can plug in 25. Okay, so I think that's mostly it for this. These definitely need to be included for these, uh, for these three functions you come up with. Um, this was sort of a, let's see, what was this part two? Maybe a part three is deriving the vector components. So just a recap of the situation here, we had something like this. We have this n vector perpendicular. And so what's happening here that's going to be new is that we don't assume that the magnitude of this L vector is equal to one. This is something that we did in the, I think maybe the first pass at looking at how to pull out these components. Um, so what we want now is a vector. Yeah, but instead, let's, uh, I guess we should think of this as a cell of T. Instead, let's let the norm vary over time. Since the vector L depends on T. And the way it varies is just going to be that EFT that we already came up with. So we'll want model two things kind of separately is one of them is what is the angle of this L vector over time. And then we can just think about, you know, one fixed vector of a fixed length kind of moving through that angle over time. And now E of T is just going to tell us how do we scale that vector up at individual times. So maybe a time near time zero, you'll have like a little, this is like maybe L of three or something. But then by the time you get to L of six, maybe it's kind of a bigger vector. Maybe if you're up here in like L of nine, it's an even bigger one. And hopefully I can just draw it this way. This works. Yeah, so you think of like a small vector. Let me do, uh, if I can pull all of this out. Yeah, so it's kind of an animation to think about here. So orange is like the, the L vector, and you can imagine that at, at lower times, it's like a small vector, maybe it's even zero. As you kind of rotate it through, it grows. Maybe it's just, it gets to its like longest point here. And then maybe it kind of shrinks back down as you go back through the rest of the angle. Eventually, by the time you get down here, it's back to zero. And then it kind of resets the next day and just does the same thing. So it's something that kind of sweeps out, something like that. That makes sense. So just the point is that the vector length depends on time, or really depends on the angle. Um, and the way it'll depend is that the length will just be your E of T. Okay, and so we can choose. So we'll choose a coordinate system. Let's 
say a long n. This should be familiar from previous class. So we'll want to do something like this. We've chosen an origin and we've chosen it so that it kind of lines up or at least our, so there's our n vector and there's our y hat direction. And we kind of want these to line up so we don't have to worry about the n hat. And this is the x hat direction. I'm sorry, they just the, we don't have to worry about the n direction, at least for this. And we're thinking about this vector L of t. But now it's not radius 1. So here is L of t. We have a radius that now depends on time. And the important thing from before was that we know that some some components of this vector just won't contribute to um, the amount of energy that's absorbed. So this red thing is not going to be contributing anything because the light rays are sort of parallel to the leaf. And this green one will be doing all of the contribution. This green one is can be L sub y. I should be labeling these with vectors everywhere. This green one is L sub y now depending on t. And this red one is L sub x now depending on t. And as a, as a vector, we have L of t is equal to L of y of t. Remember, plus is this kind of funny thing here. It's not like an addition of numbers. It's an addition of vectors where we do this tail to tip kind of addition on them. Um, and it's just equal to the sum of these two component vectors. And so what will happen here is that, well, the radius, as it depends on t, what we've been calling the radius kind of all along in all of these geometric things we've been doing with trig functions, this is literally the same thing as the norm of the vector. Just now that we, we've chosen a coordinate system, so the radius actually makes sense because we can measure, you know, a distance from zero because we've chosen a zero. Um, and we've set that. So this, this is just kind of a fact that the radius of a, uh, in this picture will be the length of that vector. And we're setting that equal to E of T. And the question is, what is the norm of L y of t? So we have some vector L sub y. This y component is changing in time. This one you kind of have to imagine, but you can draw something that makes it more clear. Um, yeah, so you can imagine this vector being swept out over time. And if this vector is like down here at a really small time, then this green component is really short and the red component is maybe long. Maybe if it's sweeping out some kind of circle, maybe it's growing, changing in size over time. And you get up here, then now the green portion is very long and the red portion is very short. And if you're you know, directly up, the green portion is everything and there's no red portion. You kind of have the same story over here in quadrant two. So the lengths of the red and the green kind of change over time. And we want to know what the length of the green one is. And here we'll just use the standard kind of trick stuff we've been using before. So here's this thing we said was theta sub L. We can label an adjacent op opposite and hypotenuse. We know that sine of theta sub L. It all depends on T now, so we have to kind of keep track of that everywhere we go. Well, I just know from the geometry of the situation, if I just fix my time t, it's just the opposite over the hypotenuse. And what is the length of, so I guess I should say, the opposite is the length of L of y. The hypotenuse is the length of L. The adjacent is the length of Lx. I just mean here that the vector Lx isn't the same thing as like the length of the vector or that the number for that line segment. 
like a vector has a magnitude and a direction, a number is just a number. So like adjacent opposite, opposite hypotenuse, these are all just numbers, but they're kind of associated vectors that have those lengths. So if I have this geometric relationship, well, I know that the opposite is given by the length of Ly t, which is the thing I'm looking for. And the hypotenuse is given by, well, is the radius as a function of time. But then we saw that this was just We're going to make this e of t. And so one thing you can conclude from this by kind of moving the e of t to the other side is that the length of ly of t is equal to e of t sine of, I guess in this case it was theta sub l of t. This is an important um, Thing to work out in the project. Again, don't, you can't really just put in this this final answer. You need to like somehow go through some of this derivation of like having the components of this vector, identifying them in a graph, um, saying what all of the like saying what the geometric picture is, and then doing a little bit of this this kind of derivation of how do you find the 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 contribution, I guess, of the the y component, the component that lies along the um, the, like in bar, the vector in direction. Okay, with just a few minutes left, so maybe I can say finally what, what else has to go into this. So this is, I guess, part three. Part four is we would now want to compute a total energy. Um, density. And this will be some function gamma of t. And what it'll be, I'll just say here is it's going to be the component, or sorry, the, the length of the component that's lined up with the leaf um, in this picture above. So that incorporated like the, the energy of t, incorporated the, the kind of angle. And the idea is we just multiply this by an area. And what this ends up being, say for what we've just done above, is e of t times sine of theta l of t times the area. OK, so you'll get some kind of function that depends on t, and it should somehow look like the function you've chosen for e of t, but also we see there's this kind of sinusoidal component coming into it too. And the area is just a constant. It's just the, the surface area of the leaf. Um, so you'll get a new graph. You want to graph this thing. So this is going to be gamma as a function of t. And I can't really say anything about what this graph will look like. You'll have to, it'll, it'll depend heavily upon what you choose um, for your EFT. But um, I don't know, it may look something like this. Probably not exactly like that. It may not increase and decrease in this way. But I think it should be zero at time zero and it should be zero at time 24. And so you want to graph this on this interval. No, sorry, I just saw somebody mention something in chat. We care about the angle the leaf hangs from the tree. Do we assume it's parallel to the ground? Um, I have to think. I think for this first part, yeah, so I think in the first part, you're going to assume that it's parallel to the ground. Then there's this uh, second part about, uh, yeah, maybe the leaf is at an angle or maybe it's rotating throughout the day. Uh, so I think where that would come into play is, yeah, sort of when you set up this picture, is that your this picture might be skewed a little bit, um, kind of like at some angle. In which case, 
Yeah, so if you imagine that this whole picture was at this angle instead, which I think is probably what's what's in the handouts, um, there's just some third angle down here, uh, I call that psi. And then the only difference would be that this new thing would be theta sub L plus some constant angle. So essentially all of this would work the same, except for maybe you have to add some constant angle psi, which is measuring the, yeah, maybe it's the angle of the leaf from the ground. And what I think what that'll do is it'll probably just take these graphs here and it'll shift them up vertically a little bit. But I'll also, I don't mind if in this first part, if you just make the assumption that things are just level with the ground for the first part, I think that's totally fine. Okay, so what we want to do here, um, so what'll happen is that this is like some kind of energy density. And so if we want to compute like total energy, this will be equal to like a density times uh, like a time interval. Okay, and this is like essentially area in this graph. And so what happens here is that you'll you'll start at some like little time t0, you go up to t1, and you will measure whatever the uh, let me do it in a slightly different place. Let's do it over here, t0, t1. So this is going to be the total energy used in this time period is something like this. So we just think about this region following the graph there. Okay, so that's the actual energy being used in that time is just all of everything that's in here. So what we're going to do is approximate that by saying, okay, well, we know the function value at this point. So we're just going to make kind of a rectangle here and we're going to measure in green, what is the area of this rectangle? That's going to be our approximation. And there's going to be some error associated to it. This stuff in red, we're not counting. Okay, so the way this will go is that this uh, interval will be a width delta t equals t1 minus t0. And so this thing, our approximation will essentially be gamma at t0. That's the height of this, this rectangle. We're just evaluating it here. It's t0, gamma of t0. And then times delta t. And then to get the total energy, what you want to do let's say so this was total energy in one like a interval of the form T naught to T1. So you want to break up 0, 24. Sorry, I realize we're we're at time now, so I'll wrap this up really quick, we'll just say what, what needs to go here. Um, what you're going to do is break this up into say 0 to t1, and then some other union t1 to t2, so on and so forth, all the way up to you know, tn to 24. So I forget exactly what the project handout 
um, zooms here. Maybe it's like these are 15 minute intervals or maybe they're uh, one hour or two hour intervals in the example. And then the formula will be well, essentially delta zero times delta t, well, sorry, delta t zero, delta t plus delta t one, delta t plus so on and so forth. So again, you just evaluate the function at the first coordinate, that's like the height of the rectangle. You multiply by your delta t, you add all of these things up, and then you get an approximation. Okay, so I think that's probably all I have for today. Um, I will try to jump in office hours. Let me, sorry, let me pull up time. Uh, yeah, so between 11 and 12, I will aim for, and then also three to four. So office hours, 11 to 12, three to four today. And I will try to post them up for tomorrow as well. Although I don't know the exact times yet, but I'll try to post those on ELC. And uh, then just email me if you, I'll do some by appointment um, outside of that if you need it. So, all right, thank you guys very much.